politics in Utah politics has, uh, is the treasurer of the Utah Democratic Party, which is an elected position. Uh, she has served in the past as the chair of the LDS Democrats in Utah and uh, is active in the same group nationally. Um, so she's, uh, if you look at her bio, she's very active in the Democratic Party. Uh, she labels herself as a progressive bridge builder. Um, lots of campaign work. Uh, currently, though, she's uh, the executive director of the Utah Cultural Alliance, uh, which is heavily involved in the Utah arts community, including uh, the, uh, you know, work with the, uh, and she's also had past work with the symphony and the opera and so on. So lots of, of varied experience, lots of experience on boards, as you see from her bio. Um, she's spoken here before. She's very uh, interested in linking up with students. She'll be, uh, she's usually at our speed networking event at the Capitol as well. Um, uh, I think I mentioned this on the opening day. As we set up speakers, we try to be uh, as uh, open we, as we can to different uh, backgrounds and parties and everything. So, uh, and I think actually even if you're, uh, even if your partisan and ideology are not uh, matched up with Crystal's, the lessons she has generalize across parties. I mean, the same things that you would learn in one, you'd, you'd, you'd practice in some form in, in the other. Oh, uh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm so sorry to be 30 minutes late. That's amazing. Um, it is it is it is scary out there. Let me tell you, I'm glad to be here alive. So always be grateful for that. Um, so for those who heard me last year, there are some elements that are similar, but I I uh, did a little bit of reframing because what I really wanted to talk about today was how everything I learned about politics I learned from the arts. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that. So um, being a lover of literature, wait, this way, okay, um, I really had to fight the urge to begin this lecture with the famous words, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, but who, who said that? Who is this? Charles Dickens. This is going to be very interactive, so you guys could tell me who you think there are. And of course, let's go back one. What's this piece? Guernica by Picasso, one of the famous pieces of political art. So, who am I? Um, child of heavenly parents and earthly parents. I really wanted to showcase this beautiful painting, Her, by LDS artist Eliza Cross. Uh, this is Caitlin Connolly. Does anyone recognize this book that this comes from? <laughs> oh, how wonderful. This is a wonderful book that you can get at Desiree Book that's all about heavenly parents, which is pretty exciting. Um, now, if there's one thing to know about me, it's that I wear a lot of hats. Who's this artist? Magritte. Very good. Uh, this is his painting, Decalomania. And you may not know this, but one of the largest collectors of Magritte paintings lives in Salt Lake City, the Mattis family. They knew him back in the day in Europe, <laughs> and they own a ton of Marguerites, a ton of M.C. Eschlers that they bought for incredible prices, and they're very lucky. Um, I think most people involved in politics do wear a lot of hats. It's kind of the nature of the game. We have a lot of interests. We're all kind of polymass. Um, and then often the pay is terrible, so sometimes <laughs> we have to put our money together in different ways. Um, but for work, I wear one hat now, um, and I am the executive director of Utah Cultural Alliance, which is the advocacy voice for the arts and humanities. And uh, basically that means I'm the lobbyist for culture. And we have a 501c4, which of course is heavily advocacy focused. We endorse, we can recruit candidates, we grade voting records. Um, and then our 501c3 is kind of more towards the public oriented. And so we are the managers of NowPlayingUtah.com, which is the statewide events calendar of everything to see and do in the state of Utah with a heavy emphasis on the arts and humanities. So if you're ever bored, you can go to that website and find something to do. And uh, um, it gets 1.3 million visitors a year. And then we also have a tool called the Cultural Asset Map, which is kind of a, a visual version of NowPlayingUtah.com. And uh, we collect economic data 
and all sorts of things about culture. Um, before I started working for Utah Cultural Alliance, I had a branding and consulting business, and so I worked with a lot of nonprofits and political campaigns over the years, and then before that, I started my career at Utah Symphony Utah Opera um, doing marketing for them, and the Symphony and Opera r remained one of my clients when I still had the business, and now they're one of my members, so you never know when places that you work may become connections later on during your career, even after you've left them. Um, in my personal life, uh, I'm married to Joel, this is my husband Joel Otterstrom in the corner, and we have two children, Betty, who loves photobombing, so she's hardly ever actually posed in a picture, and then this is little Edwin in the corner. Um, my, oh, I wasn't supposed to advance yet. In my volunteer life, this is where the hats get ridiculous. Um, I am the Emeritus Chair of Elias Dems of Utah and Elias Dems of America, still sit on the boards. Um, I'm leader of the Utah Women in Politics PAC, co-founder and board chair of the Salty Cricket Composers Collective. And then I serve on the boards, so annoying <laughs> all these things, but uh, Americans for the Arts, the Arts Action Network, Utah Arts and Cultural Coalition, um, Alliance for Better Utah, Utopia Early Music Festival, um, Planned Parenthood of Utah, Musinia, LDS Composers Network, my, I'm the chair of my school's community council at Emerson Elementary, and I used to be the treasurer of the Utah Democratic Party, but I actually just resigned last at the end of last year, and it feels so great to have one less thing <laughs> to do. Um, and then at church, I have the best calling ever, which is primary music leader. If you ever get a chance to do that job, it's the best job there is. Um, so my life, people always say, how do you do it all? Which, um, you know, first of all, you may notice they only ever ask women that question. They hardly ever ask men who do lots of things. So. Um, First, be careful when you ask someone that question, but um, with a lot of creativity that can give you the ability to work quickly, to be able to think critically um, quickly, you can come up with things quickly. And so my life model used to be a quote that you may recognize that people often um, attribute to Goethe, but really it was spoken by John Anster, who was freely translating Faust, so he kind of inserted this language into his translation of Faust. Um, what you can do or dream you can begin it. Boldness has genius power and magic in it. Only engaged and then the mind grows heated. Begin it and the work will be completed. Of course, they usually put it slightly different than that, but that's how John Answer originally quote unquote translated but not really translated Faust. But I've always loved that because it reminds me of Alma 32, which is kind of like faith becomes reality, right? When we have that hope and desire, we can make it happen because faith without that action, right? Hope, faith without hope, uh, uh, now I'm messing up my phrases, but you know where I'm trying to go, right? <laughs> it's, it's real faith has that action behind it, that doing it. Um, so this, of course, is by Vasily Kandinsky, um, fabulous painter, but what you may not know about him is he was also an amazing cellist. Um, and he was a synthete, so his paintings are very much how he heard music. So he, when he hear, heard music, he would see color and images, and so that's, that's really what he painted. Um, but now my new motto, um, and the lovely ladies of my Relief Society, who are more senior than myself, are the ones who said, Crystal, this is needs to be your life model. Ecclesiastes 3, chapter 3, verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose um, under the heaven. So who is this? Dolly, good job. Surrealism. So Magritte and Dolly were both surrealists. And so, you know, never feel like there's something you can't do because you don't have time for it. You might have time later on. And you never want to overcommit yourselves. Believe me, I'm there all the time. <laughs> but it's good to have them throw. And so these are some of the lessons that arts and humanities have taught me that have impacted my career and my uh, experience in politics, both as a partisan uh, a uh, campaign strategist and consultant, and also through my work now as a lobbyist working on a nonpartisan issue. And so, what do you think is the number one thing that the arts teaches people? The words in the title. 
creativity. <laughs> there are so many ways that uh, being involved in the arts gives you creativity. And there's actually study after study done that says that creativity is the most valued trait by employers. And so if anyone ever tells you that your arts or humanities degree is useless, you can say, well, but I can think creatively and I can do the next thing, which is what do you think is the second big thing that, yeah, thinking, critical thinking. That's really where the humanities are focused, especially is that critical thinking. And um, I actually asked some of my friends to tell me what lessons they have learned from the arts and humanities and how that's impacted them in politics and in their careers. And my friend Scott Konopasik, um, he said, I have multiple degrees in the sciences and the humanities. He works in the sciences. I credit my critical thinking and problem solving abilities directly to my studies in the humanities. Similarly, the humanities have given me the ability to embrace ideas that to many are in opposition to each other. And for him, like being Mormon and a liberal. <laughs> But uh, I actually, so like I mentioned, I'm chair of my school community council. And what school community councils get to do is we, we, there's this pot of money called the school lands trust money. And it helps fund our public schools. So the bulk of our money for public schools comes from our state income tax. And then this school lands trust kind of supplements. And the state of Utah has this unique formula where uh, governance of schools is shared between parents and teachers at the school. And so that's what the school community council is. And we oversee policies. So say, for example, dress codes or policy, uh, tardy policies. And then we get to decide how to spend this money. And my school has been spending um, their SITLA funds on intervention, which means having a specialist come and take problem children out of the school, out of the classroom, and give them some extra teaching, was, which is a great thing. <laughs> but the parents on our school community council would like to try something different because we've been doing this for probably 15 years. We actually can't tell for sure how long we've been doing this with our SITLA funds because no one knows for sure. But, um, and so uh, one of the things we're considering funding is um, bringing more STEAM into our school. So that's science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And it's the scientist on the school community council who is like, you know what? I do STEM all day long, because we were kind of considering STEM and arts as two separate things for them to look at. And he's like, what makes me a better scientist is my involvement in the arts. And I said, I'm going to quote you <laughs> all over life. So we did. Um, the next one is there's something that politicians and artists, and, and really any job has in common. And there's something that we all need to survive day to day. And what do you think that might be? based on my picture. George Washington's <laughs> money, yep. This is, a, this, I don't know if painting's the right word since it's a mixed media work of art, but it's Washington Money by Robert Silver. So as you can see, it's actually made up by currencies from all around the world, this picture, it's pretty cool. Um, and, and so we have to fundraise, we have to build relationships with donors. Um, there are many artists who would just love to create and create and create and have, no ties to capitalism or supply and demand or or uh, having to beg for donors for their nonprofits. And uh, unfortunately, that's not how the world works. <laughs> and so we have to learn to build relationships. And we have to learn how, as one of my friends put it, kiss up to rich people. So it's kind of the way that it goes. And, and, and another thing that's interesting about the arts world is it's very much a, a commodity, like anything else that can be bought and sold and trade. And so there are, you know, kind of market forces that help determine worth for artists, as for one artist versus another artist. And, maybe their price is driving up because they create such few pieces in a year, you know, kind of that, that supply and demand. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I actually, so this is a little backstory for me, but um, I, uh, my, my primary degree from BYU is in music, but I have minors in economics, marketing, and humanities. My humanities um, minor was actually supposed to be a major, but I found out my penultimate semester that I was missing an Italian class, and so I said, forget that. <laughs> but I always loved economics, and I started out um, 
being a dual major between music and economics before music kind of really took over. And, uh, and I, I think I always loved both because both art and economics, they sound like they might be very different things, but it's very much how our world works and it's the system. So the arts is how we might ex process trauma and experience and how we tell our stories and how we tell our history. Whereas economics, we're thinking more about how can we, what are the forces impacting what jobs and incomes are available and all that kind of stuff. So the next one is you can't survive on all details and all heart. This is a famous pa painting, of course, by Caravaggio, the musicians. And I wanted to use music as an example because in music, we are both interested in telling an emotional story, but doing it perfectly. And so in music, there's this intense uh, um, attention to detail and getting the notes right and the rhythms right and having the um, accents right and all of the things that make the music interesting and special. So we, we are on one hand perfectionists who are trying to do this this craft perfectly and mathematically and exactly. But then at the same time, you know, let's say when I'm working on an aria or something, I'm not working endlessly to get my diction right or endlessly to get this, f this phrase perfectly phrased. I'm also bringing that emotion to, you know, most of the time for sopranos, they're like about to throw themselves off of a building or something or something else dramatic, but, but bringing that um, emotion into it. And, and then it also really impacts public speaking. So if you're ever interested in being a public speaker or if you think PR might be something in your future or being a politician or a candidate might be something in your future, take acting classes, take music classes because people always ask me, why is it so easy for you to be able to you know, talk to the press or you know, come up and speak for, before a committee or give a speech at a rally or whatever? And I'm like, I'm not being asked to sing Wagner in German memorized <laughs> for six hours. Like that's nothing compared to that. And so it really does give you um, uh, much, very useful real life skills beyond just telling those things. And, and this is a, um, a quote from my friend Katie actually. And she said, you know, uh, another way that this is applicable to pol politics is, is people don't vote on the details, they vote on their heart. And that actually is something that's so hard for me as someone who's a policy wonky person. I love those candidates who are so nerdy and wonky and get into the details, you know, kind of like a Ralph Becker up in Salt Lake City. Um, but if, if you can't grab people with their hearts, if you don't have a little charisma, it's hard to get people to vote for you because not enough of us really care about those details. And, uh, and, and like she said, she said, but if the details aren't there, you won't convince anyone. So you do need to do that work to know what the details are and to know what makes your ideas good. But um, you gotta have both the details and the, the oomph. Um, the next one it, that arts and humanities teach you is truth is rarely absolute, especially in politics, right? It's always this give and take of opinions and ideas. Just today, I had a meeting this morning with a to be unnamed <laughs> division of state government who has some regulations over arts and humanities that I don't like. And I would really like to get rid of these things. And, but they believe very strongly in the purpose for why these regulations exist and what they think they're accomplishing for the state of Utah, the voters of Utah, and the taxpayers of Utah. And so, you know, we both had our ideas of what truth are, and we're not done yet. We didn't come to a consensus this morning, but we committed to saying, okay, let's, Let's keep up this conversation. Let's have some more talks about this. Let's bring both of our truths to it and see where we can come together. So we'll see where that goes. The next one is politics is theater. So I've, always, I've already told you why it's, it's useful to have some theater training. But um, so much of what we do in politics 
yeah, a lot of it is staged for purposes of the election coming up or because it's it's that performance of getting voters to care about you, to like what you're interested in or in my case as a lobbyist in in communicating in a compelling way why these elected officials should care about the arts and humanities, why there should be taxpayer dollars given to the arts and humanities, why they should care about the regulations and the policies that affect my sector. And uh, um, my friend Heidi said this, stories are the most powerful form of communication we have. Politics is theater and theater is politics. If you don't have a good story, you don't have a campaign. And the thing that I always tell candidates first and foremost um, when they're putting together their election campaign or, or deciding about if they want to run is what's your story? What's your, your 10 second pitch? You've got a voter for 10 seconds at the door. What's the compelling story? You know, is it just I want to do good for Utah or is there an issue that really drives you that you think voters will connect with? Is it maybe maybe it's this regulation you really don't like or maybe you are so bothered by Utah being 51st in the nation in per pupil education funding. Maybe it's the air, you know, maybe your children have asthma and you're struggling. So it could be any number of issues, but you really want to make sure that you've got that compelling story that's concise and you can tell it clearly. Um, I'm, I'm kind of shortening things too, but I, I, I think we're going to do this at by 520, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, Another thing that's important, and, and this kind of goes back to the, the, the truth can sometimes be relative in politics, but, but you really want to understand the other person's perspective and where they're coming from. And arts and humanities are a really what great way to do that because when you're reading a book, you're inserting yourself into someone else's psychology and often multiple people's psychology. When you're studying history, you're learning how people have thought over time, how they've put things together over time. Um, and so diving into the arts and humanities, whether or not you're doing that in your studies or if you're doing that as an individual, is something that you should keep up lifelong because it's really where you can learn where things are going and where things can go because art and humanities is also a place where people have um, thought about what's possible and what's new because we're, we're not so into following the rules in the arts and humanities, we're into innovation. Um, the next is building coalitions and bridges. You may notice there's kind of this theme about working together and bridge building because that's what real effective lobbyists and politicians do. The ones who like dig their feet in the ground, they get nothing done. I love this picture because it's a story of compromise between these what you would consider might be the elected officials of the day but like, look how messy it is still, right? Like there's a lot going on. There's the people at the table signing the agreement, but it kind of looks like there's some disagreement. There's people who aren't, un there aren't sure about it. There's all these faces that are like, hmm, I don't know about this. And other people who are like, this is really great. And, and, and that's what compromise is. And that, you know, that the adage of like, if nobody's happy, you did it right is often so true, like we all have to give things. And I will say one thing you try to do in negotiation, I hope you guys have studied negotiation as part of your, of your studies, but you really want to come prepared with what are your, your absolute firm things you can't budge on, that was like, um, and then what are your things that you can have wiggle room on that you know, you know aren't a big deal for you to give up, but your your person you're negotiating with doesn't necessarily know that. <laughs> and so they might think, ooh, they're giving me this great concession when you were prepared to give them that great concession, right? And so you want to kind of be thought, you, you want to th think through that. Um, my friend Paul says, being an artist taught me how to balance staying true to my vision with knowing when it's necessary to make some compromises to bring that vision to fruition. He's a filmmaker. Um, I can double that as a composer. Um, that's my primary art form is, is writing music. And I have learned that when I throw crazy hard music, even at the best performers, the piece is never what I want. And so I always start, I get much better results when I start tailoring that piece for the player or I'm thinking about what are realistic techniques and expectations I can make of them. 
Um, this one I thought was really funny. One of my friends said, symbols have power. That's something that people should tell you. This is the worst political logo ever, right? And we all hope it's fake. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen this explosion on Twitter. But this is why when you're thinking about symbols and politics, bring artists on your campaign who can tell you that is visually terrible. Um, this next one I think is interesting. This is my friend Eric said this, and he said, everyone is in it for themselves. That's what art has taught me about politics. <laughs> and I thought that was a funny thing to say because, you know, even in as noble of a profession or a study as the arts and humanities are, um, we all still have to pay our bills. We all still are thinking about are we going to be artists with a legacy or things like that? Um, myself, as uh, a leader of an association, I have members. I have to be able to clearly explain to my members what is their self-interest in paying their membership dues to fund my organization. Of course, in the arts and humanities, because we do live in such noble times, um, it doesn't work for me to say self-interest to my people, but I have to say things like, here's the value that you're getting out of your membership. The nice thing about politics is I can say self-interest <laughs> and nobody gets offended, but sometimes in Utah they do. And um, this is a funny thing from my friend Stephen, but he said, and I think this is kind of related, speaking of self-interest, although I don't think he would admit this is self-interest, but he said, Wagner taught me to burn everything down and build a soci socialist utopia on the foundation of art, <laughs> which you got to see the self-interest in there. He wants to be able to create work on end, whatever he wants, with no forces or no thought to money, right? So that's kind of funny. Here's my last lesson, since we're now a little bit past the 520 mark. Um, I think one of the most important uh, life skills that I've embraced about myself, that I've tried to communicate to my children, and um, that I try to tell people all the time, and, and it's two things. And the one is... You be you, you do you. And related to that, as my mom would always say, the Mr. Rogers, I love you just the way you are. And so, it, especially in the arts and humanities, we really embrace what makes us unique, what makes us stand out, what makes one composer better than another composer, or different than another composer, or a writer different than them. You never want to be accused of being just like someone else or saying, you know, people always like to tell me what composers they hear. My, you know, what my influences might be in my music, and I have to say I really hate that conversation <laughs> because I just want them to hear what I had to bring to the piece, not what Elliot Carter had to bring to it or anything like that. So, so I would say embrace your unique forms in the continuity of space. This is Boccio, Boccioni, sorry, I totally butchered that Umberto. Um, famous modern Italian sculptor, really great artist. And so I think I can wrap there. I have more things, but we're over time. So, questions? I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> try. Um, so while I was at BYU, um, I first started in college Republicans. Uh, my parents are civically involved. Um, obviously, you know, you can tell from some of my board involvement, I have switched. And I actually um, realized my, my political leanings were not Republican when I went to those college Republican meetings. <laughs> and I said, goodness, everything my parents taught me is not what you guys are talking about. Of course, my parents would never never admit that their political ideas are really not Republican either. But, um, uh, and, and so I, I w helped with campaigns then. I mean, even in college Republicans, I canvassed for Bob Bennett, which I would do again. He was an amazing human being and I'm good friends with his descendants. But, um, uh, uh, so it started there. Um, I did uh, kind of take a pause for grad school. Really didn't do anything political in grad school. I was very focused on on music in grad school. Lived in New York City, did the big city thing. But um, when I came back and um, started working in arts administration and fell in love with that, um, pretty much immediately got involved in politics. I did activism first for a long time. 
um, uh, was involved with a lot of rallies and things back in the day, um, you know, doing stuff with, with Rocky Anderson and all that. And it was fun and I learned a lot, but, but I also learned that being part of the system is where I could really make positive change. And so that's when I started getting more involved in first partisan politics and now as a nonpartisan lobbyist. Sure do. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, like I said before about how arts and humanities kind of teaches you that things are more relative. Um, I have learned that not all Democrats have it figured out, not all Republicans have it figured out. Um, there are, there is a lot of beauty in when we can say, well, what can we agree on? First of all, can we have um, you know a relationship with each other without agreeing together on everything? You know, I work with a lot of people who are great champions of the arts and humanities, who I think have despi despicable <laughs> opinions <laughs> on other topics, but we can work together on arts and humanities, and they love that we can work together on that. And I might be able to work with them on something else with some of my other issues. And so, so first you kind of want to learn where they're coming from. Um, and then you want to learn how to speak in a way that communicates. You know, when I'm talking to, say, a room full of Democrats, I might start talking about how important it is to, say, have equitable access to the arts and humanities. Whereas I would never say that to Republicans. I would say things like, it's important that we fund the arts and humanities at fiscally responsible levels because the arts and humanities brings creativity and critical thinking to our Utah and population and especially our school children. It makes them better employable workers. And so you learn how to adjust your language based on who you're talking to as well. And, and, and that's what a good political candidate does too because especially in Utah, you know, your, your election where you legitimately win your election might be your convention battle um, because you're in a district that leans one way or another or you might be in one of the few handful of districts that can swing either way and so you have to think through how are you communicating across across the aisle and that's, you know, Ben McAdams is so good at that and that's why he's so successful and is now a congressman and, and um, because he does that. Yeah. There's no such thing as dumb questions. Absolutely. Well, um, the nonpartisan issue is we all believe arts and humanities is good, right? And so then the, the question becomes down to what can we do for arts and humanities based on our philosophy of government? And, and every Republican in the Utah legislature, for the most part, is a realist. They know government needs to exist, government functions. I mean, Utah is a highly regulated state, let's be real. <laughs> um, and we deal with big budgets and we spend a lot of money. Um, and, and so it's, it's a question of, you know, when I'm working, because I do work with the Republican majority legislature and I'm looking for funding for arts and humanities, it's answering that question of what is fiscally responsible funding for the arts and humanities? What is the proper level of investment versus what's being too dependent on government, right? And right now our grants budget is $1.3 million, half of which actually is funded by the federal government. So the state's only contributing $700,000 a year to the arts and humanities, which is nothing out of a many billion dollar state budget. Um, the governor's put a $6 million ongoing increase to that grants budget, which will be a huge increase for us. But still collectively, if that's funded, we could fund approximately 3% of our nonprofit cultural organizations, their budgets, 3% from the state, which we've all kind of agreed is saying that's fiscally responsible. They're getting 97% of their funding from other sources, so they're not reliant on, on, on the state government. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I will say um, 
I have become really protective of my nights and weekends. And so um, I uh, don't take any more board obligations that mean that I, I have things to do in the evenings and weekends that take time away from my children. Um, there's still a, a few that, of course, I can't get out of, and, and I love going to artistic things and being at, you know, humanities lectures or whatever, but thankfully I can take my children to a lot of that kind of stuff too. Um, my, my daughter is an amazing artist already at, at the age of eight. Um, she's doing great stuff, but um, when it comes to uh, volunteer engagement, I've, I've become a lot better at saying this is how much time I can give you. I can take this project. I can't take that project. Um, it's not something I'm always great at, and definitely when the legislative session is upon me like now, that's when I really feel like, <laughs> but, but at the same time, you know, being involved in those things have helped me, um, you know, professionally. I've, a lot of my relationships with donors have come from a lot of that volunteer um, involvement. Um, a lot of my connections with elected officials have, have come from both sharing interests in, in different causes. And so um, it's, it's, it's worth not just doing one thing because you never know when something might come from that that benefits you elsewhere. Cool. You can come up and talk to me if you have any more questions. <laughs> CYO at utculture.org. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't put it in here, but um, it's on my website, utculture.org, too. <laughs>